I'm Gordon Whittington, Editor-in-Chief at North American Whitetail, and I'm proud to be on Pro Talk Outdoors. That's what I call Pro Talk. When you really don't know the answer, you just make it up. My rut is that I am in a rut. To get the pilot of Red Arrow going. There's really a way to skip class. I want to say, hey, those boys right there are entertainers. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. <laughs> That's the nicest thing anybody's ever said on this podcast. Alex Rutledge here with American Roots Outdoors TV. Hey, this is Lee and Tiffany Lukowski from the Crest TV. Hi, I'm Don Higgins. This is Jeff Lindsay. Hey, everybody, this is Mark Dury with Dury Outdoors. Hey, this is Craig Fitz of Trained Assassins TV. You're listening to Dave and JP on Pro Talk Outdoors, the craziest two I know. Hey, everybody, Pro Talk Outdoors, JP and Dave, bringing it to you with uh, some needed improvements in equipment, I have to be honest. I'm yeah, going to be up front. I mean, this is a fairly professional-sounding podcast, but right now we're struggling. Yeah, we are. We got a broken headset and uh, a missing splitter, and uh, we look like clowns right now. We look like I'm glad this isn't on video because I'm literally <laughs> holding. I, w- an I would not go live with this on video. We well, would. It would be embarrassing. You know, if I hadn't been late getting home, my plan was to video this episode. Glad you didn't. Uh, yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a bit of a struggle. I literally am holding an earpiece to my ear, so uh, we might have to budget for some new stuff next yeah, year. Just to, to kind of paint the picture. We literally have got one headset we're sharing, and it just happened to be lucky that it's broke. It, it's know? a good thing that it's, it's broken. It's a broken headset, so like I've got one ear piece on, and he's holding the other one up to his ear. Yeah, because I don't think we could have both crammed our big heads in <clears> the <throat> middle of one headset if it wasn't broken. Yeah. And I wouldn't have done it even wouldn't if we could. Wouldn't have tried it. So. Wouldn't have tried it. Anyway, uh, speaking of things that are cram jammed and uh, pretty much on top of us, deer season. If uh, If yours didn't start in September... Wherever you're at, I'm betting it's about to start, like, right now. Or by the time you're here, and it's probably already started. By the time, yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, you've got youth season coming up this weekend with Kaysen, and you think you're going to get him on a pretty good deer. Well, I, I can't take any credit for it at all. It's on Wyatt's property, and uh, Wyatt has, uh, has done a whole lot of work, you know, on his farm, as he does everywhere that he hunts. And um, he's got a really sweet setup there. He got some real-world uh, beans. Uh, got... Um, Gosh, I think he's got some deadly dozen that feeds in there, some clover chicory. He's got some standing corn that he had the farmer plant around it and uh, an elevated blind. Just, I mean, it's a perfect, perfect setup. And uh, from from everything that I'm hearing right now, every time he's checking the cameras, he's got some pretty good deer coming in there to it. That's awesome. And, I mean, conditions are going to be pretty solid. It's going to be lower 70s, which in southern Indiana is pretty good for an opening day not you know not 60s -hmm. like you would hope but here lately it's been much warmer than that so that'll feel nice we got some high pressure coming in so maybe uh maybe youth weekend can get off to a good start we'll see yeah uh let's hope so well uh, you know just speaking of conditions and things along that line uh something i've always found interesting and probably even more so this year is just the argument that comes up in deer camps all across the country on is the rut... Crossbow versus compound. No, 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 not that. And not it's not uh, 6.5 Creedmoor versus 270 or 30-06. No. No, it, none of that? It, more important than that, something that we all, regardless of weapon, care about, it's <laughs> does the moon dictate the rut or is it a static thing every year that never moves. And, you know, some people have opinions one side or the other or somewhere in between. We're going to chat with somebody that uh, hopefully you've heard of, and if you haven't, I know you've read his stuff in North American Whitetail, Gordon Whittington. He's going to come on, and we're going to chat and go into a pretty good little dive about what really he thinks is the issue here. Which one is it? Is it static? Is it time by the moon? JP, just for people like me in layman's terms, what do you mean by static? Like it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It's it's the same. It holds still. You, you know what static means. I, I know. I know. It's consistent. There you go. So anyway, we'll be back in a quick break. You're listening to Pro Talk Outdoors. <laughs> 
Hey everybody, welcome back to Pro Talk Outdoors, and just like we teased before the break, we've got the Editor-in-Chief of North American Whitetail, Mr. Gordon Whittington, on with us, and Gordon, thank you so much, number one, for, for coming on, and number two, man, I hope you're not cutting out any preps for deer season right now to talk to us. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and while we'd all rather be in the woods than, than be indoors, I guess, that's part of what makes us hunters, um, I'm not currently scheduled for anything in the short term. I'm, it's probably going to be early November before I get back out there. Oh, wow. You uh, you tied up with the magazine for the next foreseeable future, or you just uh, got a plan in mind? <laughs> well, I, I generally try to focus on when I think my odds are best, and... You know, just because of the magazine, it's it's a full-time job in and of itself. So before we get out and really, really hit the ground trying to, you know, produce television footage and, and hunts, you know, we've got a lot of our big fall issues that are just now really being put to bed. And, in fact, we're about to, we're just starting to edit on our December-January issue, which will come out in, you know, middle of November. So I can't go play before that's done. But, but once that is done, hopefully we'll get a chance to get out there. Well, since you you touched on that a little bit, am I correct in saying that you've been with North American Whitetail for the better part of three decades now? Is that right? I moved to Georgia from my native Texas in the first week of June 1984, and I didn't start editing NAW right after that. I was working on some other magazine projects with this small company that was just getting started. Uh, These were the people that had founded North American Whitetail, and Pretty quickly after that, I got integrated in as an editor on the publication, and really by about 1985, I was pretty much the head bottle washer, I guess you'd say. So it's it's pretty much been that way since then. So you know, call it a third of a century, you'd be pretty close. Gordon, when was the first uh, first magazine produced from North American Whitetail? There was one issue in the fall of 1982. It was just called Volume 1, Number 1. I don't think it even had a month date on it. And the reason, I believe, as I understand it, talking to the guys later, they said, look, we didn't know if there would be a second one because they were in the magazine business but not putting out deer magazines or not putting out national magazines. They were putting out some state hunting and fishing magazines. So they felt like there was probably interest in big deer, but there wasn't another big deer magazine out at that time that was national. And they thought, well, it's a worthwhile experiment. We'll try it. But since we don't even know if there'll be a second one, we won't even put a date on it. And so I guess you could say that it it went over pretty well because here we are 30 six years later and they're still producing magazines so so evidently it did work well i got a question for you and 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 i'm going back to to my childhood here uh because i'll be honest with you uh north american whitetail magazine was just i mean that was just huge for me as a kid whenever uh i remember the very first um the very first magazine that i'd seen um was had the hole in the horn buck on the cover and I don't remember mm-hmm. exactly when that was. That was probably mid '80s. I'm not sure when, and you could probably tell me when it was. But um, were you involved? Uh, you were involved at that time with the magazine, weren't you? Yeah, that actually hit the newsstand in the fall of 1983. That was the December 1983 issue. Okay. And so I was. I knew the guys that were starting North American Whitetail. I knew them at that time, but I had not yet moved to Georgia, so I wasn't really directly involved. I had actually written some articles for NAW prior to that issue, but I wasn't directly involved at that time in helping to break that particular story. Of course, of course, over time, I, you know, became very familiar with it and worked with, you know, the hole in the horn story quite a bit over the years after that, but I was not really on the front end of that wave. Okay. Well, shifting shifting gears a little bit, I know you and I talked a little bit earlier in the week when we set this up, but uh, it's something that just divides people in office cubicles or out on a construction line or in deer camp or, or wherever, you know, just a, a coffee table somewhere. Is the rut timed by the moon and lunar effect, or is it static and, and stays the same roundabout time every single year and I know you've got just decades of, of research and opinion on this and, and I'm just curious to hear exactly what you think. Well to be honest with you I think it's a multi-part question and 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 the reason I say that is because 
as a hunter, never mind, you know, I'm, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a, I'm not really anything. I'm just a good old boy from Texas that loves deer hunting. But I will say this, my general opinion is that while there is always going to be variance year to year, in fact, even day to day in deer movement and buck activity and number of does and heat and how many scrapes are being hit and how many bucks are rubbing and all these things, I really don't see myself a huge variance over time in the dates when that happens. And, and, and part of this is, See, I'm not. I really don't care to hunt deer that are actively breeding as much as I want to hunt bucks that are trying to actively breed. And because and those dates aren't always the same, as you well know. I mean, yes, sure, bucks are chasing does when they're about to breed them, but frankly, a lot of the ritualized buck behaviors that we all you know tend to look for. I mean, a buck coming to rattling, a buck checking a scrape line, a buck buck sniffing on a doe's trail or something, but maybe not actively breeding, you know, those those are the things that get buck shot more than anything else. I mean, really, if you look at, especially bow hunting, I mean, it's for every buck that is killed, you know, three steps behind a doe with doing a lip curl while you shoot him, there's a hundred that aren't, you know, but they're but they're on their feet looking for does. They're, they're actively trying to make something happen. So, so that ritualized, you know, quote, breeding behavior that is not necessarily the actual active breeding, to me, is what I'm largely hunting because I just feel like that's when you got the better, best chance of seeing a buck on his feet in daylight. And if he doesn't come to you, then you've got a chance to get him to respond to some kind of, you know, decoy, rattling, calling, whatever it is, or scent, and, and come on in and give you a shot. So to me, I look at it like even if they're – if I said, look, you know, if somebody says, well, you've you got to pick the dates, the seven days you want to be in the Midwest from now through the rest of your life, and you can't change it, you can't look at the, you can't look at a moon calendar, you can't look at anything, when are you going to go? Well, some guys might say, well, I don't know when to tell you because I don't know what the moon's going to be year to year. I'm telling you, I'm going pretty much the same dates regardless because I'm just not going to worry that much about the moon. I've killed them on every moon phase there is, but I would say – if I look back at, let's say, 30 or 40 mature bucks that you've killed, or however many a guy has killed, let's say you've got, let's say you've killed 30 of them. If you'll look back, in my case, when I went back and looked, and I knew the dates when I'd kill those deer, and some of these deer were all the way back to the late 1960s, and I looked at the dates that those deer were killed, and then I checked online to see what the moon phase was. And the worst moon phase that I found, period, for killing mature bucks, in my case, without trying to, without necessarily trying to go out there and pick my hunting dates because of the moon, because I didn't do that. I just went hunting when I could. But when I look back at what I'd killed, the worst of the four major moon periods for me was first quarter. Now, obviously, that's halfway between the new moon and the full moon. Now, a lot of guys would say, well, man... You know, um, you know that ought to be that, that ought to be pretty good because it's still kind of dark and and all, and the moon's not getting bigger, but it's not really big yet. That ought to be a good time for me. It has not been. Now, now just because you don't have a deer head on your wall doesn't mean it wasn't a good time to hunt. I mean, maybe maybe you just picked the wrong tree that day. Maybe the bucks were running crazy, but you didn't happen to be where they were. So I'm not. Those are a ton of bias built into this, as it is with anybody's anecdotal evidence. However, I would say that I've had better luck on a full moon than I have, you know, a week prior to a full moon. And two weeks prior to a full moon, of course, is, you know, pretty much a new moon, which is no moon. So, you know, I think you can fake yourself out. I think you can convince yourself that, oh, it's not worth going. It's too hot. It's too windy. The moon's too big. That's whatever. And it's like, hey, just go hunting. I mean, if you go hunting, you got a chance to kill one. That's true. You can't shoot them from the couch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, depending no, on no, where your couch is. Yeah, exactly. I've seen some couches where you could, but they were <laughs> they were also pretty fancy places, and they had a big front yard full of oats. You know. <laughs> right. So, do, you know, do you think that weather is a much more determining factor? So, you know, if you're the guy that's saving his vacation days for, you know, five days somewhere, you know, at the end of October or, or through the middle part of November, are you telling him to, hey, man, wait as long as you can and, and kind of look at the weather? Or are you still saying pick the same five days every year? Well, in my case, but you know, I live right outside of Atlanta. 
uh, it's a rare year that I even buy a Georgia hunting license, period. I usually do not hunt within three, four, five hundred miles of where I live. And I usually am going to a place I've never been before. I'm usually going to a place, I mean, sometimes it's with an outfitter, sometimes it's public land, sometimes it's whatever. And so in my case, I'm having to schedule a cameraman way in advance. I mean, I already have my dates picked out for when I'll hunt this year because I have to have cameramen assigned to go with me. Now, because of that, I can't just wait and say, man, front coming in this weekend, Joe, grab your camera, let's go. I don't hunt that way. I can't hunt that way. Now, the average guy can hunt literally, you know, with a day or two or three notice, or he can call in sick one morning because there's a heavy frost. I can't, I can't do that. Now, people assume I can because I'm the editor-in-chief of North American Whitetail. I probably live in the woods. I don't live in the woods. I hunt, I'm in the woods maybe two weeks a year. So I've got to pick those dates based on something besides weather and, frankly, in many cases, besides moon. I just say, look, this is a good area. Historically, these are the dates that if you're there and the weather is not horrible, you got a chance to catch a mature buck on his feet. And if you can do that, you got a chance to kill him. So my situation, I might seem like the best guy to ask these questions, but in some ways I'm totally an anomaly compared to the guy working down at the post office. He can take vacation. He can, you know, he can he can hunt after work or do or before work in the morning. I can't even do that. I really can't do that in my situation. So I have to kind of pick what I think are year in and year out are going to be the best dates, and then I have to just frankly just have to take my chances. And that I'm not picking any hunt dates two or three or four days ahead or even off a 10-day forecast. I mean, I'm having to pick those things at least a month or two in advance. Let me ask you this question, Gordon. And going back to, you know, checking the moon phases on, in like over the years and the, the big bucks that you – or the mature bucks that you've harvested, what percentage would you say comes on maybe like the new moon? I know you said the first quarter is probably the worst for you, but how does the new moon relay in there versus, you know, I know you said the full moon is probably the best – is the new moon probably the second worst behind the first quarter? Well, I tell you, the very best quarter, the, uh, Dr. James Kroll told me this a few years ago. He said he had tracked it with GPS collars on deer and just looked at, you know, trail cam, you know, number of trail cam images and all kinds of things that, that would show just general deer activity. And he confirmed with me, he said, what I told him about, you know, what I thought about first quarter, he says, you're right. He said, it is the worst of the four quarters, four, ba four basic quarters of the moon. He said, actually, he believes that the last quarter, which, of course, is two weeks after the first quarter or a week after the, you know, a week after the new moon, excuse me, the full moon, he said that actually around the rut tends to be when you have the most does in heat. Now, again, you know, I tend to see buck activity year in, year out, tends to be, to me, about the same dates. However, that doesn't mean that that's when deer are being bred. You know, it could be that the moon really does influence the actual bre active breeding in terms of, of those com coming into estrus, but it might not necessarily, at day length itself, which of course is constant by the calendar, day length itself might have a bigger trigger on actual just general deer activity so but he says you know it, around the rut you know a week after the full moon which of course is last quarter he said that basically is that's a heightened period of breeding activity and of course it depends on when that full moon happens to fall see this year we have that new moon in early november and so to me, the guys who are going to say, well, look, you know, it, it, let's say early November is good this year. And people are seeing a lot of deer movement. The, the weather is right. The crops are out of the fields. The deer are moving. No, not a big acorn crop. Just deer are being seen and hunters are happy. You know, whether they're killing them or not, they're seeing them. Okay, so that makes hunters happy. So let's just say that happens this year. And people say, look, it was this, it was this dark moon during early November. That's why it was rocking and rolling. And another guy might say, well, yeah, you know, maybe so, but, but I still think it's got to do with the moon. People are going to tend to find, you know, support for what they already believe. That's just the way, that's human nature. But I just think, you know, to me, if a guy will just go pick these same dates every year and hunt them, I think he will tend to see, you know, given relatively equal weather, I think he'll tend to see the same general activity. 
that's just that's just been my experience. I got a question for you. We we recently did a um, a sportsman's banquet over in Illinois, and one of the speakers while we were there was Dr. Grant Woods, and mm-hmm. he made a statement that and and I I hadn't had a chance to talk to him about it, but I wanted to ask you about this if you'd known of any studies like this. He made a statement that he felt like the moon had zero effect on anything because radio collared study showed that deer moved the exact same whether it was in the first quarter last quarter new moon full moon whatever so it had no effect on it whatsoever now my question was and and i'd like to know is this the radio collared studies is it taking into account the time of day that a deer is actually moving or is it saying just in a 24-hour period do you know of any specific studies on that that's a good question, and not being a deer researcher myself, I would certainly defer to those who are. And uh, that said, uh, you're exactly right. Let's say let's say that during the um, let's say that during the last week of October, you get some three and a half year old buck that is really starting to feel the rut coming on, and he's pretty frisky, and he's an aggressive kind of, you know aggressive type of personality if you will in a buck and he's and he's living in a place where he knows where four or five doe groups live in literally a three or four square mile area and that's not very big to a buck really i mean that's you know especially in open country i mean they could easily cover that whole area every day in fact some do and you look at the telemetry data for that date and you say man this buck this buck covered eight and a half miles today you know, but again, it does matter. Did he cover most of it between 6:30 in the evening and 5:30 in the morning? And if he did, then I guess the question is, so what? You know, how does that help you? You know, right. he just laid down a lot. He he laid down a lot of sign in a lot of places, maybe, but that doesn't mean it was daytime sign. And so, I would 100% agree with your question and the reason for the question, which is, if it doesn't happen in daytime, does it really matter? And, and 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 I do believe that there's a ton of deer activity that we don't see. Deer are on their feet a lot. I do believe a lot of mature bucks get all get out of their bed earlier than we think they do in the afternoon. But because of the way they play the wind, because of leaf cover, because of the fact that they're moving toward a staging area, uh, they're going to check a few spots. They're going to stop and rub. They're going to loaf around. They're going to do these things as they go generally toward a dominant feeding area, getting there about dark, obviously, to a staging area. But I think these bucks are getting up. You know, obviously, a buck that lives a long way from these places, he has to get up fairly early to get there by dark. you know. And I think a lot of them do, but they move through cover and use the wind in such a way that we're not really seeing them. But I do think that you will find that those deer are not necessarily bedded until five minutes before dark and then walk a straight line a half mile to a field. I don't think that's happening. I think those bucks are on their feet, but they're just not very exposed. It makes perfect sense. It, it absolutely does. You know, I want to go back and, and touch on something that, that you mentioned. You know, I think we've kind of gotten your take on the, the moon and, and these other patterns. I kind of want to know where you're going to hunt this fall. You mentioned that you're not going to be anywhere near Georgia where are you going to be? Well, I I have planned to hunt, of all places, public land in uh, in Oklahoma uh, with a bow, and then go to a place that I've hunted before uh, up into southern Kansas mm-hmm. with a friend of mine, and uh, that's all bow, whether it's vertical bow, crossbow, whatever, I'm not sure yet. It'll probably all be vertical bow, but I'm not positive. And then that may be all I actually do in November. That's for 10, 10, 12 days or whatever in November. And then after that, then I have to do some real work back at the office. But then after that, I'm going to try to get back to the Texas. And, uh, you know, Texas is a big state. I mean, if I say I'm hunting two time, two places in Texas, people think, well, that's a short little trip between. Well, these places are about 600 miles apart. Uh, but neither one of them is on the border. <laughs> I mean, Texas is a big state, so I'm going to hunt the Panhandle in early December with a rifle, and then I'm going to go down and join Dr. Kroll and another friend of ours in South Texas, uh, which is getting you know its past rut uh, in in December in a lot of Texas, but South Texas, of course, is coming into the rut. So we're going to hunt down there during during the rutting time in December. After that, I just don't know. I might end up 
who knows where. But uh, but those are the main places that I have figured out. I think that I'm going to hit this fall, and if I hit any other places, um, you know, Ohio, Kentucky, Georgia, wherever, it'll be a little bit more on the fly, I guess. I got you. So most of this stuff is done almost blind for you, then, right? It really is. I mean, you know, even when we hunt with outfitters, there's always a misconception, I think, that, you know, the quote TV guys or the writers or whatever, well, they show up, somebody sends a limo to the airport, picks them up, they got a valet, <laughs> they go out there and they get put in stand number 11 so they can shoot old Smokey who's coming out at 4.18 p.m. and he's coming in from the left and then get your sandbags ready and shoot him and then you'll be a hero. Well, Man, I'm looking for that hunt because I've never gotten on that one yet. But, but if those hunts do exist, they they don't really they don't really reflect reality for most people. And and we're trying to show we're trying to show real hunts. I mean, we we never hunt high fence on. Uh, you know, our show is just purely fair chase. Um, sometimes it's outfitted, but like I say, sometimes it's public land. Sometimes it's sometimes it's my own land up in the midwest sometimes it's my family ranch back in texas where i grew up and shot my first deer we've we've shot tv shows there you know and so we we try to show some of all of it because when north american is part of your name it's kind of like you have to cast a fairly broad net you know i can't just do all my hunting in iowa i can't do it all in texas i mean we we try to move around as a team and show some of all of it and that's part of the fun of it, but it also adds to the challenge because quite often we're hunting places we've never been before, and we got four, five, six days to go from A to Z, and hopefully Z means a tag on a deer. And uh, doing that on camera is a pretty good trick, but it's it's fun to try even when you don't succeed. And i got to give a shout-out to, to what you guys do with North American Whitetail Television as well. and. Uh, appreciate it. I'm, I'm good friends with uh, Mike Clerkin and, and have known him mm-hmm. for many, many years uh, before he even got into uh, videoing with uh, Real Tree or Hunter Specialties and North American Whitetail and, and what you guys are doing there. I, I actually did some filming with him way back when. I don't want to say how long ago, but it's been quite some time. <laughs> but uh, I, something I'm very impressed with is, and, and I know Mike does a, a, he makes a conscious effort of doing this. He tries to get out and use different type weapons every year. I mean, you know, you, you might see him with a handgun. You might see him with a crossbow or a vertical bow. You might see him with a rifle, a muzzleloader. And, and I love the inclusiveness of that because too often, I think, today, there's a there's a divided camp there. You know, you know, some guys think, oh, crossbows are bad or, you know, you shouldn't use that kind of weapon when you're when you're hunting deer. But I, I really like the message that you guys are putting out there about, you know, hey, it is North American whitetail and, and everybody should be represented and every type of camp should be represented there. And I, I really like that message. And I think you guys do a really good job of bringing that out. Well, we sure appreciate that. And, and it is a conscious effort on our part. I mean, I've I'm trying to think if I look back and, and I haven't hunted Canada much since we started doing TV because Canada is really tough for television. You sit all week and you freeze to death and then you see one buck and he's one minute of camera light left and he's in a snowstorm at 300 yards walking across a cut line. And you got to try to make a TV show out of that. Even if you can kill him, it's pretty tough. And so I haven't hunted Canada much, you know, and so we really, I'd like to hunt Canada again. You know, I've hunted it a lot of times, but it's been a long time since I've been up there with TVs. But, and Mexico is, 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 is not for everybody. I mean, a lot of people say that, well, what's well, dangerous or whatever. I've got, there are fantastic people in Mexico and fantastic hunting, fantastic ranches, food, the culture. I mean, it's, it's just a great place to go, but I haven't been in several years. So most of what I've done, of course, is, you know, the United States. But I have, I mean, I'm one of the few guys that shot them in Oregon and Washington. A lot of people don't don't even know you can find whitetails out there, but you can. I mean, I've, I've shot one in New Zealand. I've I passed one up in Finland. I mean, I've hunted from eastern Canada to a lot of places, I think 40-something states and provinces. And, you know, the one thing I would say it's really helpful to me as the editor in chief because I have I have a broader perspective having been to those places. That even if I didn't kill a deer there, I learned a lot, and part of what I learned was what people here deal with, and what they deal with. You know, the way people hunt in a certain place, there's always a reason for it. You say, well, why would people chase deer with dogs in a swamp in North Carolina? Because have you ever been in that swamp and tried to see a deer? I mean. It's a jungle, you know, and that's how they grew up hunting. So there's a reason they started using dogs. There's a reason people have high racks in South Texas 
where you can shoot from a motor vehicle with the motor running on private land, and it's totally legal. You don't even have to get out of the truck or, or cut the engine off. You can just shoot one from a high rack, if you will. Well, that's the only way you can see over that brush. If you want to cover 5,000 acres, you have to be where you can see it, and you're not a human drone, so you so you hunt from the highest seat you can find, and then you drive around. Well, there's a reason that evolved. There's a reason people do deer drives and push the bush in Canada, because there's not many deer, and it's a, it's a big area, and they have snow to tell where the deer went. So you look at all the things that you learn by going these places and hunting with people or even just talking to them, and you realize over time that, man, the whitetail is an incredible animal. It lives from the top of the northern Rockies all the way down into Central America. It lives in Peru. They've taken them to Finland. They've taken them to New Zealand. I mean, this deer lives everywhere, and everybody loves it. You know, And why is that? Because it's a special animal. And to me, for, for me to have spent 35, a little over, you know, roughly 35 years now in my life, working directly with them here as an editor and a writer and, and TV guy, whatever, that's, uh, that's a pretty unique experience, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, I've been very blessed to, uh, to have been in the position I'm in, and if people have gotten something out of that, and especially the way we've tried to cover it and present it to them and help maybe everybody appreciate not just big deer but just deer in general and the culture behind the whole whitetail story, then to me, we, we've done our job. And, you know, some months better than others, but I like to feel like we've, we've helped people appreciate the animal. Well, Gordon, I, I really appreciate the perspective, not only on that sentiment, but pretty much all of it. Uh, it's well thought out and calls on a lot of experience. So I, I want to say thank you for that, and, and thank you for everything you guys do with the magazine uh, and, and the show and all of it. Uh, it, it does. It enlightens everybody that's exposed to it and, and opens a lot of eyes. So I think you guys are doing a, a great job. And along that line, what's the best way for everybody to keep up not only with the magazine uh, but the television show and, and social media and everything you guys are up to? What's the best way for them to follow? Well, that's a good question. Obviously, we have the magazine itself. And in general, if people want to know more about North American Whitetail and what we have going on, the, the central hub for all that, for a lot of your, your listeners and, and people out there, would be NorthAmericanWhitetail.com. And we're in the process right now of revamping the website. It's going to have a lot more dynamic content on it here. And uh, so we're in the, the wheels are moving on that, and it, I expect some of that to roll out here very shortly. But but you can also find our subscription services on there, uh, where to go to get a subscription. Obviously, we're on newsstands everywhere. Uh, TV show, of course, is on Sportsman Channel several times a week, the sportsmanchannel.com is, of course, where you find out all the Sportsman Channel listings. And then, you know, social media, I mean, we're not that hard to find, and we try to be pretty visible, and we try to be responsive when we hear from people. It's, it's hard when you have a hundred and something thousand circulation to be pen pals with every reader, but we do our best, you know. And same way with TV, we, we, we welcome inquiries and suggestions, constructive criticism, uh, photos, you name it. I mean, we just want to hear from people and know that we're doing what they want us to be doing on their behalf. Well, Gordon, excellent job with all of that and an excellent job today. Thank you so much for coming on. Hang with us through the break. You're listening to Pro Talk Outdoors. All right, everybody, about to wrap up another episode of Pro Talk Outdoors. And big thanks again to Gordon Whittington from North American Whitetail. A guy Love the perspective. A great perspective. It, so well thought out. You can tell he's a guy who sits and reflects either when he's in the stand or at his desk, but you'd have to be pretty reflective to be that successful of a writer over such a long period of time. I, you know, I'll tell you something that he said that it, it really resonated with me is, you know, because I've been this guy before. Uh, I have to admit it. I've been this guy to say, man, I would never use dogs to hunt deer. I would never ride in the back of a pickup truck on those high racks to hunt deer. But I've never hunted deer in those locations, and, and I didn't grow up in those those areas, and I, I don't know what kind of challenges those folks face whenever they're trying to go out and fill a deer tag. So it's completely understandable, and it's a good perspective that he said, you know, you understand why they do those things when you go to those areas and you hunt. Yeah, so. and, and it may not be for everybody. You may not think it's right or want to do it, but the whole shtick that he mentioned is it's North American whitetail, and with as big a geographic region as North America is, 
three countries, one of which is you know filled with just such vast, diverse environment that you have to showcase all of that stuff if you really want to do your job and do your namesake yeah. justice. And that's exactly what they're doing. Yep, good stuff. So, yeah, hey, if, if you want more information on the moon, uh, don't ask us. We don't know. Don't ask Gordon because he doesn't think he knows. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Bottom line is, guys, get out there and hunt every opportunity you have and, uh, you know, gather your own information. You know, what I, what I think maybe works for me may not work for you. And uh, just because somebody happens to be a quote-unquote professional or expert doesn't mean that their way is the right way and the only way. Well, we're we're a testament that a camera doesn't make you a professional. So, well, that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> we we don't know any more than the next guy. We just happen to record what we don't know. So, <laughs> until next time, hook 'em or hunt 'em, Pro Talk Outdoors. Later, guys. <laughs>